I'm Dr Edith Chow, Senior Research Scientist at CSIRO and the Royal Australian Chemical Institute's Nihome Youth Lecturer. This is an activity of the RACI's New South Wales branch and it commemorates Sir Ronald Nihome, who was an outstanding researcher and passionate educator. Hello and welcome to CSIRO. We are in one of the senior laboratories where cutting edge research is being performed across chemistry, physics, material science and nanotechnology. Now I wish I could be here in person but instead you have me via video which ain't too bad because you get to see our laboratories and some practical demonstrations. Let me just tell you a little bit about myself. I grew up and went to high school in Western Sydney where I studied chemistry and physics. Now a lot of students ask me about my grades in school. I had good grades but they weren't excellent. And let me tell you, you don't have to be top of your class to pursue a career in science. If you find science exciting and you're curious about how things work, I would encourage you to explore this further. So I took on two science subjects, but equally I enjoyed design and technology because it allowed me to express my creativity. Science is also about being creative. As a research scientist, you have to come up with innovative solutions to problems and develop new types of technologies that people around the world can use. I studied a Bachelor of Science with honours, majoring in chemistry at UNSW. I had two really great lecturers who instilled their passion for chemical analysis into me and I decided to pursue a PhD with them. After my PhD, I was very fortunate to land a role at CSIRO, which is Australia's National Science Agency. Nowadays, I don't see myself as just a chemist because my training at uni and working experience equip me with broad scientific skills. My research encompasses multiple disciplines such as nanotechnology, and I get to work in a great team with diverse skill sets. This is my colleague Andrew, he's a bigger scientist. And this is Edith, a nanoscientist. Now what is nanotechnology? Well nano is all around us and it's all about making materials and devices that take advantage of their unique properties at the nanometer scale. Nanotechnology may be a relatively new concept but it's been known since ancient times. For example the red colour you see in medieval glass comes from gold nanoparticles. This is due to the light scattering properties of gold particles. Antibacterial shirts and socks are likely to be embedded with silver nanoparticles. Silver has been used for centuries to kill harmful bacteria. Ship captains would toss silver coins into storage barrels to keep drinking water fresh. Zinc oxide is quite effective as sunscreen because it can reflect UV rays away from the skin. Zinc oxide in its regular form appears white, but nowadays zinc oxide nanoparticles are more widely used because they go on clear. Nanotechnology is not just about nano-sized materials, they also encompass nanoscale features. For example, you have the billions of tiny transistors which are in computers and smartphones. Nanotechnology promises to make computers faster and more powerful, all in a smaller total volume. There is also the self-cleaning properties of lotus leaves. The water repellent surface is due to its nanostructure, which I will talk more about later on. Now, how small is nano? Well, there are 1 billion nanometers in one meter. To put this into perspective, imagine you are the size of a fly. A fly is one centimeter, which is 10 million nanometers. If you go 100 times smaller, this is roughly the size of algae, which is 100,000 nanometers. If you go a further 100 times smaller, then you can see bacteria, and we are now at 1,000 nanometers. And if we go smaller still, this is where we encounter the fascinating world of nanomaterials. Now, if you were to ask me how tall I am, I would proudly share with you that I'm 1.5 billion nanometers tall. Not too short, eh? Let me show you an example of how materials can behave differently when they become smaller. Let's take an aluminium can. Now, aluminium is not particularly reactive, but when you make it into a micro or nano-sized powder, it can become an explosive. 
And that's because for the same amount of material, there is a greater surface area. Now, to make fireworks, you need powdered metal such as aluminium or magnesium. You need an oxidizer for it to burn, binders to hold the mixture together, and metal salts to give it color. Now, I think we're ready for a demonstration, but I'm not going to set off any fireworks. Instead, I have the rocket tablets. And what I want to demonstrate here is how surface area affects reaction rate. I'm going to add a whole piece of barocca to a beaker and one which has been ground up to powder form. Now I'm going to add 100 ml of water to each beaker. Pay attention to which is fizzing more and also to the colour intensity and how it changes over time. Which one is reacting faster? You can see that the powder Barocca reacts faster and it is more intense in colour, whereas the whole Barocca tablet changes more slowly in colour over time. Let me explain in more detail. If you had a cube that was 1 by 1 by 1 centimetre, it would have a total surface area of 6 centimetre square. If you were to slice this cube so that you have many 1 millimetre sized cubes, you would have a total surface area of 60 centimetre square. If you were to break this down further to 1 nanometer size cubes, the total surface area will be 60 million centimetre square, about the size of a football field. Because chemical reactions occur at the surface, having a large exposed area would increase the rate of reaction. This video is now after two minutes, and you can see both reactions are complete. They have both stopped fizzing and they are the same colour intensity. I'm now going to talk about my favourite element, which is gold. Gold is a lustrous solid metal. It's popular as jewellery. It's a very good electrical conductor. And part of the reason why gold is so widely adorned is because it's highly unreactive, so it doesn't tarnish. In fact, you can only dissolve gold using aqua regia which is a highly concentrated mixture of nitric acid and hydrochloric acid. I was very excited to have an article featured in Total Girl magazine on why gold is so valuable. Now in the magazine, I would have loved to have featured beside Katy Perry. Instead, I had Detective Pikachu by my side. Now being a research scientist is like being a detective because it's a process of discovery where you gather information and then you have to work out how to best utilize that information to solve the challenge. So let's take our magnifying glasses and zoom in on gold. Gold in its nanoform looks and behaves quite differently from bulk gold. They show quite fascinating optical, electrical and chemical properties. If you have gold nanoparticles between 10 to 100 nanometers in diameter, you find that they can disperse into water and that the color depends on the shape and the size of these particles. You can also form thin films of gold nanoparticles by loading them up into an inkjet printer, such as the one shown behind. This inkjet printer allows you to print onto any type of surface, such as paper, glass or plastic. When gold nanoparticle films dry, you can see they look just like a golden film. However, they behave quite differently from bulk gold because you find that these gold nanoparticles are no longer an excellent electrical conductor and they are no longer chemically inert. Instead, they show electrical resistance and they are chemically sensitive. Now, what can one do with these particular properties? Well, one can use these as chemical sensors that are extremely sensitive to their environment, whereby the electrical resistance will change in the presence of a chemical species. So, for example, being able to use such sensors for environmental monitoring, such as detecting toxic pollutants in air or in water, 
For food analysis, such as monitoring food freshness or alcohol content in wine, what I find most amazing is how you can also use these for disease diagnostics. A research group from Israel has shown that you can diagnose cancer from exhaled breath. A small handheld electrical device consisting of gold nanoparticles will respond to different components in your breath to give a characteristic signal. Now let me show you the differences between gold nanoparticles and bulk gold. Now this here is just a regular sheet of gold foil. Now if I were to measure the electrical resistance using a multimeter, you'll see that the gold foil is actually quite conductive. It shows very low resistance, 0 0.2 ohms. Now if I were to take a gold nanoparticle film and these are gold nanoparticles deposited onto a glass slide and if I were to do the same and measure the electrical resistance you'll see that it shows quite high resistance close to 200 kilo ohms but what's really fascinating is that if I were to breathe over it you'll see that the resistance will change dramatically and that's because the gold nanoparticles are really sensitive to my breath. It's picking up the chemical vapors. Now let's go back and do the control experiment with the gold foil. Now if I were to place the two probes over it, you can see once again it's showing 0 0.2 ohms. I breathe over it and you see it didn't actually change electrical resistance. And that's because gold is chemically inert. Now carbon in its nanoform is also extremely fascinating. You may be familiar with carbon that's in graphite pencils or diamonds, which have a different type of structure. These are allotropes of carbon. Now when it comes to nanomaterials, some fascinating structures include carbon nanotubes, graphene and carbon nanofibers. Hey Andrew, can you tell me what is graphene? Yeah, sure, Edith. So graphene, which I have a sample of here, is a single atomic layer of carbon atoms. And it was first discovered in 2004 by two very clever scientists who won the Nobel Prize. And what they did is they got some graphite, and they were actually able to peel off a single atomic layer of this graphene with some sticky tape. Oh, fantastic. What can you use graphene for? So graphene has lots of really interesting electrical and mechanical properties, but specific to my research, I use graphene to try and make high-speed flexible electrons. That's very nice to know. A carbon nanotube is a single layer of graphite which has been rolled up. Carbon nanotubes are just a few nanometers wide. They are extremely lightweight, but are 50 times stronger than steel. This makes them quite attractive for sporting equipment, allowing better control and higher performance. Similarly, carbon nanofibers and polymer composites can be used as lightweight structural composites in automobiles and aircraft. Carbon nanofibers are cylindrical nanostructures with graphene layers arranged as stacked cones, cups or plates. I've talked about nanomaterials based on gold and carbon. Now I'd like to talk about quantum dots such as cadmium selenide, which are semiconducting nanoparticles capable of transporting electrons. When you shine UV light onto quantum dots, they can emit light of various colours. They have important medical applications. For example, quantum dots can be used in place of dyes to light up and colour specific cells to be studied. They can also be conjugated to anti-cancer drugs for delivery to different parts of the body. A lot of inspiration for research comes from nature. If you take a close look at a blue morpho butterfly, you'll see that it has tiny nanostructures which interact with light to create iridescent colors. Now what I'm going to do now is to spray some alcohol onto the butterfly's wing. What you'll see is that it fills the spaces between the tiny nanostructures so they now reflect green light and not blue. When the alcohol evaporates, it will appear blue again. Because the colour you see is not coming from pigments, it will never fade. 
These types of structures can be inspiration for a new class of fabrics which exhibit colour without chemical dyes, for low energy electronic devices or colour changing chemical sensors. Another excellent example is the lotus leaf. Have you noticed how when rain falls, water beads up and collects dirt along the way? This is because the surface of the lotus leaf is super hydrophobic, meaning it doesn't like water. If you zoom in to look at this, you can see it has very rough features which do not allow water absorption. This self-cleaning ability has stimulated extensive research in self-cleaning windows, paints and fabrics. Now I'd like to end on a sticky note. If you have seen gecko lizards, you'll know they can climb up walls. In fact, they can stick to all sorts of surfaces. And this is because a lizard's foot is covered with nanometer sized structures which can adhere to a lot of surfaces. You may have also seen sticky photo prints, similar to this one here. They are easy to peel in place. And later remove and reposition. And that's because if you take a close look at the back of these prints, they have tiny suction cups, similar to a gecko's foot. In summary, nanotechnology is being used across many disciplines, ranging from smart coatings, environmental monitoring, bioimaging, catalysis and computer processing. Scientists like me are working collaboratively across disciplines to tackle problems in different ways, but are also drawing inspiration from nature to develop new types of materials. Well, I hope you all enjoyed my video lecture and are inspired to look around and see where else nanotechnology is being used in our everyday lives. If you are keen on learning more, I have a list of resources on this page. I would like to thank the Royal Australian Chemical Institute's New South Wales branch for making this Nye Home lecture possible, Dr Andrew Scries from CSIRO for his assistance, Detective Pikachu for his guest appearance, and of course I would like to thank the schools for hosting this lecture and all of you for your attention.